I've talked before about how at the end of the pipeline, any objects that are in the pipeline get piped to out default, which magically turns those objects into text. Um, that was actually kind of a lie, or, or at least a vast oversimplification. The real process is a bit more complicated, and I think it's important that you know what's actually going on under the hood. So we're going to take a look at that. Out default actually redirects objects to another commandlet called out host. Out host does the work of displaying objects in the console or, or host window. And it's good to know this because there are some there's some kind of gotchas that can come up that, that make things go a little weird on you, and I want you to know why that happens. So let's talk about outhost. Outhost can't actually display normal objects like processes and services and so forth. It can only display something called formatting objects, which are generated by PowerShell. So when outdefault gets a bunch of objects from the end of the pipeline and it sends them to outhost, outhost looks and says, well, these are normal objects. It can't deal with those, and so it calls on PowerShell's formatting subsystem to take those objects, create some sort of textual format, create formatting objects, give the formatting objects back to Outhost, and that's what gets displayed. Now, there are several rules that come into play to determine how objects are turned into that text format. Let's take a look at those rules. You might want to jot them down, take some notes, because they're going to come into play again and again as we work with PowerShell's formatting subsystem. First, PowerShell looks to see if the object type that it needs to display already has a view defined. These views are defined in special XML files, some of which are included with PowerShell itself. You'll see them in PowerShell's installation folder. They all have a .format.ps1xml file name extension. You can also create your own format views, something I cover in the advanced PowerShell course. So, if a view is defined, PowerShell uses it and the view itself determines whether or not to use a table, list, or wide view. If no view is defined, PowerShell goes to formatting rule number two. Although they might not have a view defined, some objects do have a set of default display properties, which are defined in another XML file. The one that comes with PowerShell is called types.ps1xml, although you can define your own type extensions too. Again, it's something we cover in the advanced course. If a set of default properties is defined, PowerShell will use those properties only for the next decision. If not, PowerShell will consider all of the object's properties in the next decision. And the next decision decides whether to use a list or table layout. If the properties under consideration number five or more, a list is used. If there are four or fewer properties, then a table is used. Remember, the number of properties is taken from the default display property set if one exists for this object type. If not, then all of the object's properties are counted for this rule. Finally, PowerShell takes the properties it's using and the formatting layout it's decided on and calls the appropriate formatting commandlet to create the formatting objects it needs to create the text output. It chooses between format table, format wide, and format list. Here's the whole process in action. I run get service to produce several service objects. Since there's nothing else in the pipeline, these are piped to out default, which receives them and then simply passes them on to out host. Out host sees that they aren't formatting objects, so it determines which formatting commandlet to call using the rules we covered and sends the services to that formatting commandlet. The formatting commandlet consumes the objects and produces formatting objects, which are sent back to out host and are used to construct the text display that you see. And that's just what PowerShell does on its own. You can pipe objects to, to any of the formatting commandlets on your own to choose a layout other than the one PowerShell would choose. Remember, though, that the format commandlets consume the objects you pipe in, and they output formatting objects that only the out commandlets can deal with. So the format commandlets you use should be the last thing in your pipeline. Let's look at some of the different ways in which PowerShell can format output. I'll start with just get service so you can see what the default is, three columns. All right, you now know that these three properties were selected by Microsoft as part of PowerShell's configuration. Now let's pipe get service to format list. There's the default list output, pretty lengthy. When that's done, let's take get service and pipe it to format table, selecting just the name and status properties. We've done something like this before, and the resulting view isn't great. 
PowerShell tries to fill the screen, but since we've only selected two properties, it leaves a lot of space in the middle. Let's try again, this time specifying the auto size parameter for format table. Much nicer looking results that way. Okay, one step further. Getting services, only this time I'm going to sort them by status before piping them to format table. I'm also going to use format tables group by parameter to have the services grouped on status. It's important that you first sort on whatever property you plan to group by. Now, because I didn't specify any properties, PowerShell will use the default three properties we've been seeing all along, but it'll group the services into a running group and a stopped group. Finally, let's pipe some services to format wide so we can see that PowerShell picks up the name property for this two column listing. All right, you already know how to work with aliases. You know how to create aliases with new alias. If you've created a bunch of aliases and you want to share them with someone, you can use export alias to write them to a file, and they can use import alias to bring them into their shell. And aliases just make an easy way to, to work with commandlets, and being able to export them makes an easy way to share your custom aliases amongst a, a work group or a team or, or whatever else. Two quick examples for you here. Get alias lists all the aliases, while export alias allows me to export my aliases to a file. I can share that file with other administrators who can import my aliases into their shell. Now, how do you get information in and out of PowerShell? Well, there's a couple ways. The read host and write host commandlets read and write directly from the console. So read host is a way to get input. Write host is a way to put output directly in the console window. There's another commandlet called write output, which does not write directly to the console window. It writes to the pipeline. Now, sometimes the difference between those two can be a little bit difficult to make out, so I want you to understand. Let's take a look at the difference between write host and write output. There's a big difference between write host and write output. Let's say I write hello using write host. That string object is passed directly to out host, which displays it in the console window. That's a quick and easy way to get output directly to the console, and it completely bypasses PowerShell's pipeline. With write output, things can look similar. I can produce a string object, but it's written to the pipeline. That means out default will receive the object, pass it to out host, which displays it in the console. A longer route, but it seems like the same end result, right? Well, not quite. Let's say I put another commandlet, such as where object, into the pipeline. Now, write output produces a string, but it's piped to the next commandlet, not directly to out default. That second commandlet might just filter it out of the pipeline completely, meaning there's nothing going to out default, nothing going to out host, and nothing appearing in the console window. So writing to the pipeline can be very different than writing directly to the console. As you can see, whatever I type here is placed into the pipeline, meaning it winds up going to out default, in this case, and being displayed in the console. I can use write host to display text directly in the console, bypassing the pipeline. Write output seems to do the same thing, but it doesn't. It's actually putting the string object into the pipeline, where it winds up going to out default, which displays it in the console. The difference between write host and write output might seem pointless with these simple examples, but let's take a more complex one. Here, I'm writing a string object to the pipeline using write output. That is being piped to where object which will only keep strings with a length equal to 5. My string was longer than 5 characters, so it is removed from the pipeline, leaving nothing for out default to display. Because write host, however, writes to the console without using the pipeline, it has some unique capabilities, including the ability to assign foreground and background colors to text, as I've shown here. Please pause this video now and follow the instructions in your lab guide to complete this lab. There are hints in the lab guide if you need them, and try to complete the lab without referring to the solution in your lab guide. When you're done, resume this video and I'll review a sample solution with you. Let's see what I came up with for lab 10-1. For task 1, I needed to see some of the properties and methods of a service object. So I piped get service, which retrieves service objects, to get member. If it seems like this course is harping on get member a little bit, good. That means you're getting the message. It's one of the most important commandlets in the shell. Now for task two. I retrieved a bunch of processes, sorted them by their responding property first, and then the name property, 
and then pipe them to format table, displaying only the name, ID, and whether or not they were responding. This is how you can start to gain some control over what your command output looks like. In task three, I retrieved services and filtered out those which were not running. I formatted the remaining objects in a wide list using just the name property to get a convenient two column list of services which are running. For task four, I took the other approach, getting all the services and formatting them as a list, displaying all of their properties. This is a long list, but it's a useful technique that you should keep in mind. By piping objects to format list star, I can not only see all of the properties, I can also see what values those properties contain. So if you're wondering what values are contained within, say, the status property, this is a good way to find out. Now for task five. I used read host to ask the user to enter a name and pipe the result, that is, whatever the user typed, to write host, giving it a foreground and background parameter. This is a kind of creative use of the pipeline, but it further illustrates that everything is an object. Now, I can't show you task six in the shell itself. You'll need to refer to the solution at the back of your lab guide on this one. Finally, we come to task seven. This one's also simple once you see it, but it might be complex to think about. I start with an ex expression, simple one, five plus five. The result of that is piped to write host, specifying a foreground color. Here's why this works. Whenever a command line begins with a command name, PowerShell executes the command rather than evaluating expressions. In this command line, however, I didn't start with a command. I started with an expression. So PowerShell executed or evaluated the expression and placed the result in the pipeline. That got piped to write host, which produced my output. Write host itself didn't put anything into the pipeline, so there were no objects for out default to pick up, so PowerShell's formatting system didn't come into play.